In this video, we'll be talking about the vulva development in C. elegans. C. elegans is a worm. It's a nematode. And it's a wonderful model organism to study development and neuroscience. So C. elegans are actually hermaphrodites. That means they have male and female characteristics in the same body. But initially, they are not hermaphrodite. At the early stage of their life, they are males and they have sperms. Eventually, uh, these sperms are stored for later use. When it uh, grows older, then it develops ovaries. Eventually, the eggs can trickle down to that sperm and eventually be fertilized inside the nematode. Once fertilized, the egg would eventually be released from a region known as vulva. And these eggs are laid outside. So this is the function of vulva. And we would be talking about the development and the induction of vulva in C. elegans. But before we start, we should understand why should we be bothered about learning a process in C. elegans that is not at all a human. So in that context, I would like to suggest that this particular development of or induction of vulva is a nice coordination of two fundamental signaling schemes. Paracrine and Justacrine signaling coordinate with each other in this developmental process. Just to exemplify these things, you can see paracrine signaling means one cell secretes something and other cell in a near vicinity receive that signal using a receptor. And Justacrine signaling means the cell contacts with another cell with physical interactions and this happens with the cell just next to it. Just to clarify a little bit, in juxtacrine signaling, cell-cell contact is important and in paracrine signaling, cell-cell contact doesn't happen directly but via secreted molecule. In that respect, the cell which is exactly near to a source cell can still uh, interpret it but a cell which is far away from the source cell has the capability to receive the signal obviously at a varying degree. In this case, the cell 1 would receive more signals, cell 2 would receive less signal and it depends and it's a function of the distance. And these two signaling uh, schemes interact with each other in the vulval development of C. elegans. Without further delay, let's dive in. So this is the overall anatomy of the vulva in C. elegans. So here you can see the gonad. Here is a, a cell which is known as anchor cell. It has important function and there are six vulval precursor cell which would eventually give rise to vulval cells. Now question is how these vulval precursor cell uh, obtain their future fates. So the anchor cell is here and all these six vulval precursor cells or VPC are known as equivalence group. That means they have equal capability or competence to be induced by the anchor cell. Simply, the anchor cell is working like an inducer and all the uh, VPCs are working like a responder. Now let's look at uh, this thing in a bit more details. So all these VPCs are named by specific uh, nomenclature, such as the VPC which is exactly adjacent to the anchor cell is P6 point, P6P and thereby P67, uh, then P8P, etc. So this is just a nomenclature. But anyway, eventually these cells would give rise to different uh, cell types in the gonads. So obviously the uh, cells which are exactly in the vicinity of anchor cell becomes the central vulval cell. The cells which are a little bit far away from the anchor cell eventually takes the fate of secondary or lateral vulva cells. And the cells which are far farthest apart, they take the fate of hypodermal cells. Now let's talk about what is the function of anchor cells? Anchor cell is inducer. It's a source of morphogen. So it secretes a morphogen known as LIN3. So LIN3 is nothing but an EGF-like molecule. LIN3 secretes from anchor cell from a concentration uh, dependent manner. So basically a concentration gradient is set up from the anchor cell. Now, based on the concentration, 
there could be different gene expression modules in different responder cells. For example, in P6P cells, there is, let's say, module 1. So obviously, in P7P or P8P cells, there are different gene expression modules which are activated. And this lead to different, different fate. So this is the overall outline of our understanding. But we would delve into detail about the signaling pathway. But the moral of the story is interpretation of the lin 3 gradient is important for valval fate specification. Now here we are seeing an anchor cell in the zoomed version and a valval precursor cell. So the anchor cell is secreting the lin 3 molecule which is EGF-like ligand and the valval cell precursor has uh, EGF receptors which is also known as LET23 in C elegans. Eventually uh, these cell has the capability to become uh, a valval uh, cell. So obviously there are set of genes known as valval genes but in normal circumstances they are suppressed by lin1 and lin31 complexes. So lin3 and let23 mediated MAP kinase signaling derepress this phenomena. So let23 activates let60 which is a RAS let 60 eventually activates MPK1, which is a MAP kinase, and ultimately it leads to repression of LIN1 and LIN31. So basically, repressor is derepressed, and that is why now LIN39 can bind and activate the valval genes. That lead to the fate specification of this valval precursor cell into one degree central valval cells. Now you understand the signaling basic. Now let's talk about some experiment that further proves this thing. So this is how, this is the wild, wild type scenario. Now we are well versed with the different cell types coming out of these valve uh, progenitor cells or precursor cells. So basically in a situation when the gonad is ablated, that means the, the anchor cell is gone, in that condition, all of these six cells take up the fate of hypodermal cell. Because think in this way, when the anchor cell is gone, the morphogen secretion source is gone. That means each and every cell is forced to experience a very low level or negligible level of uh, LIN3. And that lead to the conversion of the fate into hypodermal cells. So this kind of experiment done in 1981 reinforce the idea that lin 3 gradient interpretation is really important for valval's fate specification. So there are gene expression thresholds. Based on the distance, different gene expression pattern is activated. Now, let us try to understand the anchor cell. The anchor cell secretes lin 3 But why? Why not any other cell secretes lin 3 how anchor cell is defined at the first place to be an anchor cell. It turns out in early stage of C. elegans development, there are two cell types known as Z1 triple P and Z4 triple A. Each of these cell has a capability to become anchor cell. But one of them take the anchor cell fit and the other cell does not take the anchor cell fit and it takes a ventral uterine precursor fit. So, how can one cell choose one fate versus the another? And they can interact in a manner uh, which is basically known as lateral inhibition and they can force one cell to not become or not choose one fate. And this is basically a juxtaprint signaling that we'll be talking about. So let's see what happens. So let me remind you again there could be secret secreted signal by which two cells can be interacting or there could be contact-based signaling. We are now talking about the contact-based signaling which are mediated by notch and delta pathway. So lag 2 is basically delta in C. elegans and lin 12 is the notch. So initially there are different models which can suggest how this specification happens in terms of anchor cell. So initially, both these cells has equal level of notch and delta. And there is a stochastic event where one cell surprisingly has slightly more delta than the other cell. So there is a dis minute disproportion between notch and delta levels in these two cells. And this kind of differences are further reinforced and become prominent. Now one cell entirely secretes delta and another cell forms the notch. And 
eventually this uh, distinctions are reinforced to generate the anchor cells and the other second fate so two things are really important in this case first the initial difference between the two cells was created due to chance it's stochastic event and then second the initial difference once created is reinforced by feedback loops that lead to different fate choice in this case so this notch delta mediated mechanism of restricting adjacent cell fate is actually called the lateral inhibition let us try to understand this in bit more details and this happens uh, this kind of lateral inhibition also works in the fate specification of valval precursor so anchor cell is secreting the lin 3 molecule already we have shown and here we are seeing three cells adjacent to the anchor cell the cell in the center experience the highest level of lin 3 and the cells which are in the sides experience relatively lower level of lin 3 so obviously there would be a lin 3 mediated ras map kinase pathway which would ultimately lead to the production of one degree uh, central valval cell fed genes also the same uh, pathway triggers the production of delta so delta uh, lead to the delta actually interacts with notch in the adjacent cell now let 23 level let 23 levels are relatively similar in all these cells because they were equally competent but lin 3 experienced by the corner cells are less so obviously the signaling arm is now different so a different component of the RASMAP kinase pathway is activated which involves RGL1, RAL1 but eventually it lead to production of the secondary fed genes. It's also important to note that the delta and notch interaction reinforces or triggers the activity of the secondary fed genes not the primary one. So obviously once this you can clearly see once the central cell becomes the one degree valval cell it prevents the other cell in its near vicinity to take the same fate and it's forcing the other cell to take an alternative fate so one side there is differential inductive signal so every cell is experiencing different levels of morphogens and on the other hand side there are lateral inhibition that means one cell took a fate the other cell is unable to take the fate because the cell that took the fate is repressing that particular fate that means once one degree fate was committed the one degree fate is inhibited in the nearby cell and they are forced to take the second option the second degree valval cells this is how a brilliant coordination between the juxtacrine signaling and the paracrine signaling happens in the development or induction of the valval uh, fate specification in C. elegans. So I hope this was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. All the links are in description. Support our channel using super thanks and see you in next video.